I'm Levin Annemans, and yes, I'm a health economist. I know that sounds like a confession, but it's not. I'm happy to be a health economist, because what we do, if we do it right, can make the world a better place. You don't have to believe me just right now. I'm going to explain you why I make that statement. Now, to start with, I have to admit that many people don't know exactly what health economists are doing. It sounds a little bit boring, health economist. And I'm going to share with you a conversation, a conversation that I had last summer with my neighbor. We was new in the neighborhood. We started talking. And then suddenly he asked me, what do you do? And I said, I'm a health economist. So on that question, what do you do? My reaction is, I'm a health economist. But that's not helping. He asked then immediately, yeah, but what do you do? What are you doing, health economists? Okay, and then I had the choice. Or I gave him a very large theoretical explanation about healthcare and economics, or I could decide to keep it short and simple. And of course, I went for the kiss to keep it short and simple. I didn't give him a real kiss, but I tried to explain in very short terms what is health economist and what are we doing. And it's all about health. Health is one of the most important things in our lives. But it's also about money. And we don't have all the money of the world to spend on health and on health care, so we have to make choices. And that's exactly what we do. We try to find out, with the money that we have to spend on healthcare, how can we make the best possible investments so that for each euro or dollar that we invest, we get out the maximum of health for the population. That's what we do. I was not yet impressed. Can you be a little bit more concrete? All right, I'll be more concrete. So imagine we want to reduce tobacco use in the world. Are there any smokers in the room? I knew it. Don't smoke here now. Eh? <laughs> um, <laughs> but there are many options. We can have programs in schools to prevent children to start uh, smoking. We can have bans on advertising. We can have smoking cessation programs. Each of these options cost money. We have to calculate how much they cost. And each of these options have benefits. How many people will then stop smoking? Uh, how many less users of cigarettes will there be? And how many less lung cancer and chronic lung disease will there be? So each program has benefits, each program has costs, and we calculate the benefits and the cost, and then we advise to invest the money in those interventions that have the best benefit-cost ratio. That's what we do. We do the same for other things, like we want to uh, prevent obesity, we want to tackle problematic alcohol use, what we do, we call it cost-effectiveness analysis. And that's one of the key things in our job. By the way, this is a picture of my neighbor. Um, he, he said something like, yeah, I can see clearly now what you are uh, telling me. But he was clearly not happy with my examples. As you can understand, talking about uh, smoking and obesity and, and drinking to this neighbor, I should have t uh, taken other examples. I admit. But then, then he asked something very smart. He said, how do you decide how much to invest in health and in healthcare? You need health economists for that. And I'm going to give you an example. For instance, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, they have calculated that the time they wrote their report, that was 2015, that Western societies spend about 6.4% of their economy on health and healthcare. This is public money, mo money from the community. And they calculated that by the year 2060, we need to invest around 9.6%, 10% minimum estimate to 14% maximum estimate on healthcare. So we need to increase our investments in health. Why? For two reasons. Because we all get older and we will need more care. And also there will be new technologies, new medicines, new other technologies that will cost money. We need to be prepared. We need to invest more in health. Those new medicines, they need to be cost effective, of course. Otherwise, we will not adopt them. But if we want to adopt cost effective technologies, it will cost money and we will need to invest more in healthcare. So my neighbor said, so if I understand well, we need to invest more in health. And then I gave him a big smile. I love you, dear neighbor. I almost gave him a kiss, but I didn't. And why? Because this is in the core of health economics. And 
it's not exactly true that we just need to invest more in, in, in healthcare. And I'll give an example. For instance, the United States, they spend on average $10,000 per citizen per year on health and healthcare. And they have less than 68 healthy life years per citizen. Sweden, on the right side, you see that they spend much less per citizen per year on health and healthcare, and they have much more healthy life years. You also see my country, Belgium, we spend slightly less than Sweden, but we also have less performance than Sweden. But clearly, you see, if you look at the difference between the US and Sweden, something is going on. And there are three reasons why some countries perform much better than others. And the first one is solidarity. And solidarity, that means that if two people have the same healthcare need, then they also deserve the same quality of care. They should get the same quality of care, no matter whether they're rich or poor or highly educated, poorly educated, the same healthcare need, the same quality of care. That's the core of a solidarity-based system. So that means that the rich, those who have higher income, they contribute to that system much more than those who have less income. And those who have very poor income, they don't contribute to the system, but they can benefit from the system. That's a healthcare system based on solidarity. But my neighbor said, why would the rich do that? Why would you give your money away to a system that then others can benefit? Well, maybe altruism. Many people, luckily, have an altruistic attitude. Who is here an altruist? More than smokers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but that's maybe the problem. Not all of us are altruists. And a wise guy once said, the problem with humankind it is, is that there are not enough kind humans. So, why then again can and how can we convince then those that are not really altruistic to share and care, to contribute to a solidarity-based system? Well, maybe we need some hard data. We can train also our brains. We can become better altruists. I, I refer to Mathieu Ricard, who is a French biologist who wrote books on this. But we can also show hard data. For instance, Mackenbach, who is a social scientist, is really very good. He's so good, he may even become a health economist. But um, he calculated that social inequalities in health are responsible for 1.4% loss, loss of gross domestic product. And that doesn't seem maybe so much for some of you, but if our economy would drop by 1.4%, everyone would talk about a big crisis. So that's the consequence of social inequalities. Why? Because of the social inequalities, there will be a lot of productivity loss because the people don't get the care they need and there will be loss of productivity in society. And there's a second element why some countries perform much better. And again, you need health economists to understand this and to, to calculate this. Health economists have shown, it was recently published in The Lancet, that those health systems that are organized around the primary care system, primary care means that you have a general physician who works together with a nurse, with a physiotherapist, with a nutritionist, etc. They work around you in your home environment, and that avoids unnecessary emergency visits, unnecessary hospitalizations, unnecessary surgery, etc. So those countries with a strong primary care they will save money to the system and improve the quality of the healthcare system. And the final feature of good and well-performing systems is that they invest much more money in health promotion and in prevention. Some countries, they have a sickness-based model. If you get sick, we will care of your sickness, we will be paid to treat your sickness, and that's it. But countries that invest more in health promotion, they have a health maintenance uh, health system, and they invest in uh, healthy nutrition, physical activity, singing together, etc. All these things help to improve our physical and mental health in a preventive way. And it has been shown, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that those interventions that work on our environment, so they work indirectly on us, and they influence our environment, they are the most cost-effective things that we can do. My neighbor was happy. He said, okay, now I understand that health economists have really an important role. You can even improve our world. Because indeed, and he was, he was summarizing my story, it was, was great. Indeed, you make sure how much health we can get from our money. So that means for every unit of money that we spend, you help us to get the maximum out of it. 
Secondly, you also calculate how much we have to invest. Third, health economists have shown that a system based on solidarity is much better than a system not based on solidarity. Four, a primary health care system is much stronger, and again, health economists have calculated that this leads to better outcomes and lower cost. And finally, we have shown that promoting health, that preventing, is much more cost effective than waiting until people get sick and then treat them. Exactly. Fantastic neighbor. He should stop smoking and drinking, but apart from that, it's fine. And then suddenly he asked me, but you, dear neighbor, what do you do? I give lectures about it, and um, I also write books about it. Do I have still time? So take your time to look at my book. 30 seconds. <laughs> and finally, I also tell people to kiss more, to smile more, and to share and care. And that's another way also to make the world better. And therefore, the real question is not, what do you do? But Martin Luther King said a long time ago, the most important question in life is not what do you do, but what do you do for others? And that's we all have to think, what do I do for others? Thank you very much.